Far Cry is an incredibly strange beast, the series beginning daring and out there, slowly becoming more distilled and safe, as Ubisoft grew to become the behemoth of a company it is now. What once started out as a linear, stealthy sci-fi shooter has now become a gigantic open world series that has helped give way to many modern staples of the genre. The appeal of Far Cry has always been exploring exotic locations and taking down whoever is in charge of the chaos. From a scientist gone mad with power, to an eccentric warlord who worships chaos. This has always been the focus of Far Cry. You and I are gonna tear shit up! Should I stay or should I go? While on the surface the connection between sequels may appear in name only, however, they do share some common threads. While the first iteration only resembles that of a distant ancestor, rather than a game that sits within only four years of its next major iteration, there is a lot to be found in common with its predecessors. There's a lot of theories that connect all the games through story, such as Jack Carver actually being the jackal and the man who supplies guns to Hoyt and Pagan Min, but the ties are fairly thin. Despite that though, there are some characters shared across games, but it's more like a Grand Theft Auto naming convention where recurring characters in these self-contained stories are a bonus treat for longtime fans. The main thing seen repeated is a common story thread each game has, dropping the protagonist in the middle of a war they never intended to be a part of. Whether that's a war between humans and mutants, or a civil war at the hands of a mad tyrannical leader, each game's jumping off points for player motivation seems to be the same across the board. Kill whoever is in charge of this madness. It's also very clear that there is a gigantic amount of passion that comes from the teams that work on all the Far Cry games. Everything from the sound to environmental design are all so carefully crafted, it's hard to find any fault whatsoever with how everything looks and sounds. And if you watch any of the footage from the developer diaries, the love really shines through. So no matter what negatives I'll be bringing up later in this video, the love and passion cannot be understated. With Far Cry 5 on the horizon, I'd like to take a look at how the series has evolved over time, and what caused them to stagnate with a bland open world style that's amounted to huge playgrounds with very similar checklists of things to do across each later title. For this, I'll only be looking at each mainline game, so that means I won't be talking about the sequels to the original, or the expand alone to 3, Blood Dragon. While the latter is a fantastic experience in its own right, it acted more of a fun experimental homage to bombastic 80s action movies, rather than an experience that can be judged against its more fleshed out and robust peers. Before I played the original Far Cry for this video, I had always assumed 2 was the black sheep of the series, but I don't think I could have been more off base with that assumption. In a post Grand Theft Auto 3 world, I was under the impression Ubisoft had tried to capitalize on the rapidly growing trend of open world games. But that vision for Far Cry wouldn't be realized until 2007 with Assassin's Creed, three years after Jack Carver's adventures on the mysterious tropical islands. Far Cry is a clunky, incredibly goofy, and brutally hard mess of a game that winds up having a charm only a few can pull off while walking the line of being almost too cringy to bear. The story of Jack Carver, the man in the red Hawaiian shirt, plays out like a strange mix between Predator and Point Break in an ode to over-the-top action movies of the 90s. It's cheesy, but it gets the job done at being engaging and exciting enough to get the player from beginning to end. You could say the sci-fi mutant twist comes seemingly out of nowhere, I was surprised. But looking back, Far Cry did a good job at dropping hints, with some cages that have no animals but some banana bunches sitting in the corner. It doesn't explicitly say what's coming up, but allows the revelation to come not out of nowhere. It's easy to see this as an early influence and stepping stone for what later was used in Blood Dragon. The biggest problem with the original Far Cry is its wonky stealth mechanics. Given only a radar and a blip that goes off with every sound you make, it could have been enough to make a serviceable sneak and shoot style game, but with how quickly enemies can spot you, no matter how you approach a situation, brute force seems to be the way to go. It's unclear if this was intended or not, given that early on you're only really handed a pistol and told via radio to sneak past the guards. Stay low and avoid contact if possible. You don't really want to alert the guards. 
using a pair of binoculars to scout ahead. It seems this was how Ubisoft wanted players to approach situations, at least early on before all hell breaks loose. This is what leads to the game's unforgiving difficulty, being outnumbered as part of the course in any game with combat, and especially shooters. It's that sense of overwhelming odds that gives the huge sense of self-satisfaction when completing a level, but when the odds are stacked against you in a way that's more than just numbers, it leads to a game feeling like a grind rather than something that you can actively get better at. Take for example this section where I needed to sneak into a mercenary encampment, cause a loud explosion to be used as a distraction and escape. There's a sniper here in the tower on the right, and no matter what I did or how I moved forward, his gaze was completely fixated on me. This is the best example of how making difficulty completely unfair ruins what could have been an otherwise good experience. None of this is to say that overly difficult games are bad. In fact, given the current climate, I'd say the feeling for a lot of people is quite the opposite. It's just that challenge needs to be earned and not swept out from under your feet in favor of being unfair. This just makes Far Cry a product of its time. Stuck in the early 2000s, when moving out of old school practices was just becoming a norm, and a lot of games found themselves stuck between the two, and this is no exception. What is here though, is a solid foundation Ubisoft used to build an open world experience with Far Cry 2. Most first person shooters of its time were built to be run and gun. Despite different locales and weapons, the approach remained the same. Defeat enemies in an arena, then move forward. The way the game makes you approach encampments through spotting soldiers with binoculars to pin them on your minimap, as unevenly implemented as it is, is how Ubisoft proceeded to build outwards from here on out with every other numbered installment of Far Cry, and serves as a good jumping off point to talk about the rest of the series. With Far Cry 2 came the vast open areas of an unnamed African country, and alongside it, some of the most forward-thinking open-world design that has gone fairly untouched until recently. Some things introduced have carried over and become staples like the way healing works. If your character is carrying stim packs, that's a free recovery back to full health. Otherwise, you will have to wait for a much slower healing animation to play out, like mending a broken bone or pulling a bullet out of a wound. Although here, the longer recovery option is only available below two bars of health, making Far Cry 2 a little bit more unforgiving than its later counterparts. And that's the name of the game here. It's unforgiving. Everything is tailored to feel like a fight for survival in a harsh wasteland. From weapon degradation to being afflicted with malaria. Both of these are incredibly divisive, but makes the motif of survival that much more engaging. Constantly keeping players on their toes thinking, Oh, my gun is rusty, will it survive this firefight? Should I find a new one or just risk it? Then, having a gun break mid-fight is one of the tensest situations in all of gaming, causing a mild panic attack as you scramble to find an alternative, hoping you have enough stim packs to make it through. As for malaria, it can be argued that it's an intrusive mechanic that doesn't add all too much, but I have to disagree. Since it ticks along in real time, cropping up between every 30 to 40 minutes, it keeps you actively engaged in that idea of unrelenting survival, leading to some time management, but never goes out of its way to be unfair. Like, for example, when the game shifts to the second act, leading players to Northern Africa, your symptoms subside until the story is able to give you missions to get more pills. Far Cry 2's biggest fault in my eyes, is the sheer volume of random attacks the player can succumb to while traveling between destinations. A few occasionally add to the theme of survival, but after four or five traveling to a mission, these encounters can become draining, dwindling resources and gun durability constantly. One of the biggest points in its favor that I believe most can agree with is the minimalistic approach to a HUD, showing only ammunition and health. Instead of a pesky little minimap in the corner pointing out where to go and the location of every collectible, nor an intrusive waypoint on screen screaming where to go next, all that needs to be done is press a button and your character pulls out a physical map with some basic info like player location, quest markers, and the current waypoint. This isn't a clear one-to-one -one immersive experience, but it works. In a tense firefight, you need to make a conscious choice between shooting back or using your hands to see where health pickups or the quickest route out of dodge. This is a trend that the industry is only just now starting to catch up on. Games like Minecraft, Firewatch, Metal Gear Solid 5, and even Hollow Knight had an interesting take on the physical map style. As was fairly standard at the time, Far Cry 2 features no experience system, no ability trees, no perks. 
The problem with these things in later games is they take away the urgency from the player. You become too powerful too quickly, and things like buying new weapons become more novelty than necessity. It's entirely possible to play through Far Cry 3 and 4 with only the default assault rifle given, so it's with the lack of experience systems that 2 shines out even brighter, working cohesively with its other mechanics like weapons breaking, meaning you're always thinking on your feet, and if you get more skillful, that's on you and your abilities as a player, and how you've grown. One of the biggest failings of games post Far Cry 2 is the heavy reliance on the minimap. Everything you'll need to know about the immediate world around you is right at your disposal. There is the option to remove specific HUD features, sure, but these games aren't meant to be played in the state. They're designed to guide players through waypoints and pathways in the bottom left hand corner. Far Cry 2 has a simple yet elegant solution to this, and that's road signs. Different colored road signs point to various things. Having a bright red sign highlighted as you drive is a handy way to easily know where you need to be going. Painted pathways and colored signposts might sound like two solutions with the same end, but not having the constant minimap reliance helps players learn landmarks a lot easier, so they don't have to pull up the minimap as much. In a time where brutally hard games are praised, Far Cry 2 may have been a little bit too early to the punch for it to be remembered fondly. Instead, what it's survived by is the malaria mechanic and too many enemy mercenaries out to get you. Outposts are the cornerstone of every single Far Cry game's design. Each game is built around how to interact and take down these encampments. Despite its linear mission-based structure, there's some similarities with the first entry and its successes, namely the way you approach these outposts. There is always some kind of scouting tool, be it binoculars or a soaring owl to help get the drop on the enemy. For me, this is the biggest strength of the entire franchise, these moments. Even with the lack of ingrained stealth mechanics, there's something so inherently satisfying about lying in wait, scouting walk cycles, and breezing through without getting noticed. With no reliance on cover mechanics or other stealth game staples, it's just you and your wits. Far Cry 2 retained its minimalistic and harder approach by only letting players mark key locations, such as blood diamonds, health packs, and ammo caches. Meanwhile, subsequent iterations allow the marking of enemies, even going so far as to distinguish between types of soldiers from basic footmen to snipers to heavies, and allowing you to see them through walls, which can make things a little bit too easy. Although this feature can be turned off in the HUD menu, as it stands having it on by default is the intended way to play. Raiding camps is always the fun puzzle to solve if you ditch the gun blazing tactic and take your time to figure things out. With every new game, some little changes were made to keep these moments feeling fresh, like the introduction of caged animals that setting free can act like an ally, able to distract and take down enemies while you sit back and assess what to do next. Primal makes this a fully realized mechanic, giving players the ability to train wild animals to sick on unsuspecting foes. Although the best use of this whole feature is being able to pet your wolf buddy. Far Cry 4 introduced us to fortresses that function somewhat like a testing exam of what you've learnt about how to deal with outposts. Regularly, captured encampments will be attacked by pagan men's troops, forcing players to deviate from what they were doing if they want to hold the ground. Taking out a fortress, however, removes all enemy activity in a given area. Of course, these things start out very hard, but once the boss who is responsible for each fort has been dealt with, the challenge drops significantly. This, alongside how the stories are similarly structured, is kind of where all the shared DNA ends between Far Cry 1 and every other game. And that's fine. Games evolve, developers get much bigger budgets and grander ideas they'd like to see realized. It's interesting that rather than create a new IP, a completely new thing was made. Marketing Far Cry 2 as the next true sequel to the original, but with such common little ground between them, that maybe it was the themes and outposts that held it all together as a series. After the release of Assassin's Creed, Ubisoft developed a soft spot for what has now become known as Ubisoft Towers. You know, the act of finding a specific point on a map, climbing to the top and then gathering every single bit of info for a certain area. Far Cry 3 really needed to make this a point as, once you've escaped the first tutorial sequence, the next mandatory mission is to liberate a tower. 4 and Primal did this also but let the player explore first rather than railroad what needs to be done. As time has gone on, these towers have become little puzzles to solve, from the vertical approach figuring out how how to climb the tower, 
although these hanging ropes in Far Cry make this a bit too easy, to more horizontal, figuring out how to find hack points in Watch Dogs. This side of open world design has become synonymous with Yubi's open world games, only recently being dropped in Watch Dogs 2. I can see how these moments were meant to act as a way to break up your time spent exploring a world, but offer such a bland and lazy reward. It can be seen as the downfall of the company's approach to game design. Recently, Nintendo took a crack at these towers with Breath of the Wild, and actually managed to nail the concept in an incredibly interesting way, leaning more into these moments being much bigger puzzles for how to reach the top that doesn't just equate to finding that hanging rope among some debris. Not only that, but they served as a more diegetic approach, showing off the world to reveal more map. But that's as far as it goes, it's up to you to scope out the points of interest and mark them yourselves with beacons. Unlike in Far Cry where the game decides for you what you need to know in the surrounding areas. All of this would be okay if the worlds were interesting, but unfortunately despite how beautiful all of these tower laden worlds are, they're just not interesting to explore. The gameplay loop presented usually amounts to doing the same few kinds of quests. Go to a location, collect a certain thing or kill a certain person, and return. It's fairly standard affair in terms of questing, but what brings it all down even further is 3 and 4's vehicle and general movement options are incredibly dull, with one great exception to the wingsuit of course. Travel is just uninteresting. Towers unlock things to see and explore, but they all amount to the same things over and over to the point of exhaustion. Using Breath of the Wild again, a very key aspect of design it features that these later Far Cry games don't is simply movement, especially with Far Cry Primal, that features no modes of transport outside of a talent tree ability to ride mammoths. A lot of your time will be spent pressing forward and sometimes grappling up a cliffside. Zelda's latest made climbing fun, but also challenging. Can I make it up this cliff in time? Should I risk the jump? Then rewards those that make it with incredibly satisfying paragliding moments. Far Cry 3 and 4 have the wingsuit of course, but not being able to climb wherever you want at any given moment mean the jumping off points are limited to where the games want you to jump off, not where you want to, severely limiting the self-expression of movement. 2 alleviated a lot of these problems by not relying on minimaps or stuffing Africa to the brim with collectibles, but it's not entirely free from sin. It suffers from these problems too, just to a much lesser extent. I think Ubisoft knew how boring travel was in the unknown African country, and thought easier access to fast travel as a reward for liberating outposts and towers was the way to go. So much so that Far Cry 3 actively tells you to fast travel to complete a mission. It's understandable why this feature has been pushed, but acted as a band-aid to an axe wound. Sure you could cover up the issue of dull movement, but in the end you're probably just doing more harm than good. Outside of their vast expansive maps, one of the biggest draws for me for Far Cry has become the villains. 3 and 4 were sold on and have come to be defined by their big bad guys, Vas and Pagan Min respectively. While Min doesn't have as much of a presence as I would have liked, he's fantastic and each member of his crew complements his insane iron fisted fascist leadership perfectly. Disappointingly, 3 decided to throw a bait and switch into the mix and rip Vas off of his actual main villain throne and replace him with Hoyt Volker, who is explained to be worse than his predecessor and the real man behind the war. But Hoyt is boring. Hoyt may be the reason Vas is evil and causing trouble, but Vas is the reason your friends are in trouble and was the main selling point of Far Cry 3, so having the final showdown not be against him is incredibly disappointing. Conversely, Far Cry 2 was not sold on its villain, the Jackal. He wasn't given a huge cinematic reveal like his other warlord counterparts, but his role is an interesting one. Leaving the character to die of malaria as they no longer serve a threat and, after ruining his plans, still actively helping you along the way. The final task sees both of you taking a different suicide mission, each to save the country from the warring factions, leaving the lines between villain and ally incredibly blurred. Despite the fact the Jackal doesn't have much of a presence as he should, what he does have is incredibly impactful. Primal has easily the weakest big bad guy in the bunch, which is just further evidence that this game should have been an expand alone like Blood Dragon and not a full release, but we'll get to that. The story of three warring tribes in the Stone Age could have been interesting, but there is no build up of threat. Ul attacks your village one day, punches you, and then the hunt to kill him begins. Design wise, Ul is amazing, showing dominance in his battle worn face, but he's never seen or heard from again. 
Even the smaller tribe of the Izila and their leader, Batari, have much more stake in the story than Ul and the Oros tribe, which is a shame because after killing Ul, he has a sweet moment asking you to take care of his kids, which could have been much more powerful had he been given more screen time. Now, Far Cry 3's story and setting problems don't end with Vas unfortunately getting shafted. The treatment of culture is very strange, as is the growth of Jason Brody as a protagonist. Let's start with Jason. One of the strongest moments of the game is at the very beginning, when he's freaking out about seeing his older brother kill someone right in front of his eyes. Holy fuck, he's dead! Then, after witnessing the death of the same brother at the hands of Vas, Jason escapes the prison camp, freaking out in the process. It paints an incredibly solid picture and lays a great foundation for what could be interesting character growth you instantly become a one-man army who can take down pirate forces with ease. There's a specific phrase for this, but I'm not going to use it. The other issue is cultural appropriation. And before you fire off some comments calling me the SJW that I actually am, I'm not using it positively or negatively here. It's simply a term, and using it here is for a predominantly white team using characters and stories from a culture that is not their own. Is it bad? In Far Cry 2 and 4? Absolutely not. They handle everything pretty well. 3 is a different story. Maybe I am biased as there are sprinklings of Maori culture in here, a culture that, living in New Zealand, I am surrounded by. The islands in the Pacific are home to an incredibly strange cast. Jason and his friends make sense, and to a degree so does Dennis, despite his seemingly spiritual ties to the land he has come from elsewhere. The issue is with Vas, Citra, and the locals. All have three incredibly different accents and looks for people who are all supposed to be from the same land. Picking and choosing which cultures to plant in the Pacific Islands is sketchy at best and dangerous at worst, and I'm glad Ubisoft seemed to have learned from their mistakes later on. Also, one quick aside, all the Maldi voice actors mixing is very bad. It sounds like they're talking through a tin can and I can't understand why that happened. Make quick work on a guy, that's for sure. Probably kill him with his own machete. There is a lot of cool things that Far Cry Primal manages to do that, if given more development time, could have been incredible and made the game stand out significantly more than it did. And honestly, I wouldn't be talking about it, but since it got the stamp of a full price game, I think it's only fair to put it up against everything else. Primal managed to only barely outsell Far Cry 2, and considering how colossal the sales of 3 and especially 4 were in comparison, it's not hard to see why Ubisoft is shaking things up for Far Cry 5. Starting its life like its previous generation counterpart Blood Dragon, Primal was meant to be a fun little take on the map of Far Cry 4, throwing the setting and modern day Himalayas out the window in favour for the 10,000 BC setting, stripping the game of modern features like vehicles, automatic weapons, communications, and replacing them with sticks, stones, and prehistoric animals. In theory, I love everything about this game. It has such a unique idea and almost gets there. Animal companions are by far my favorite part of Primal. I can't overstate how much I enjoyed rustling the fur of my wolf buddy just because the option was available to me. These fur companions have more purpose than the pet button. They will hunt with you. With a quick whistle, you can send one on its way to attack, potentially saving you in a pinch from an attacker who was getting too close. Sharing health items is a great way to add strategy for resource management too. Making players have to think less selfishly about when they heal if their buddy is up in the action taking some hits. The base building and villager collecting side of the game is so cool on paper, but fell so flat when there is no reward outside of some boring talent tree perks. Meaning, in the end, there is no real incentive to collect villagers, which is such a massive shame. Primal has a hardcore mode that strips everything away, making players rely on the beast sense to show all items on screen. Even having a permadeath mode, but that kind of just shows how short the game is. I need to repeat this though, these games aren't made to be played without the HUD everything winds up feeling dull and movement around gets tiresome. So where no fast travel could have been a neat idea, just winds up being a major hindrance to progression. I'm hoping these lessons from a rushed major development are learnt for the upcoming Far Cry 5. From what we've seen of 5, it seems to be picking and choosing some favourite things across all iterations. Things like no minimap and partner abilities are two core features from Far Cry 2, while other staples from 3 and later like tagging enemies for outpost attacks are here too. On top of an attack dog companion that seems to function similar to those seen in Primal, now Ubisoft is notorious for overselling their games at their E3 presentations, and while I remain sceptical to a degree, I still can't help but wonder if this will be the open world game we've all been waiting for, combining all the best aspects of all the games into one masterful experience. It may seem like I'm dreaming too big with this idea, 
but the fact we're getting Far Cry set in America about religious fundamentalism shows that Ubisoft are willing to take risks we haven't seen them take before, meaning they could be risking big on how their games function too. Thank you.